The oil sands generates about 10 or 11 percent of Canada's national, uh, national uh, greenhouse gas emissions. While we've seen in the last uh, three or four weeks, uh, Suncor, Canada's largest integrated oil and gas company, has pledged to reduce emissions by 10 megatons by 2030. And just a couple of weeks ago, all the oil sands companies got together and they launched the oil, uh, net zero by 2050 oil sands pathways initiative. So lots of stuff going on, and we're going to talk to Wes Jickling, who is the CEO of the of COSIA, the Canadian Oil Sands Innovation Alliance, about that. So welcome to the interview, Wes. Thanks, Mark. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. So you posed the question in your annual report, uh, can the oil sands be part of a low carbon future in Canada? So I ask you, sir, can it? My The short answer to that, Markham, is absolutely yes. And the reason why I would say that is really there's, there's two parts to it. One is to look at the track record of, of Canada's oil sands. And you look at the track record of GHG intensity, and you look at the track record of technological innovation and collaboration in that sector. So what do I mean? In the decade from 2009 to 2018, that's the last decade that we, or the most recent decade, I guess, where we have data, GHG intensity for oil sands came down 20%. You know, that's a, a result of innovation and, and, and scale. Um, and we're quite proud of that. I, I think that's the result of, of, intense geo, uh, of intense technological innovations in a number of areas. But it's not the last 10 years that people are interested in talking about now. We're talking about a clean energy future or a low carbon future. And so you know, that, that track record, that trajectory of, of emissions in the oil sands uh, will continue. And, you know, you look at some of the technologies, the GHG reducing technologies that the oil sands are, are developing and advancing now uh, and have been actually for, for years. I'm thinking of things like CCS, thinking of things like solvent assist or, or solvent supported uh, production and in situ facilities um, and other technologies, you look at the commitments that companies are making both individually around net zero and significant reduction, you look at what they're saying together as pathways you've just mentioned, um, you combine the commitment and the type of technologies and the type of innovative minds that we have, that, that trend line is going to continue. We're going to keep seeing that in the years ahead. And so, um, you know, proud of the industry, proud of what we've done so far, but, you know, very excited about the technological developments to come. Well, let, let's talk about that, that trend line because uh, the uh, emissions intensity uh, dropped from 77 kilograms of CO2 equivalent per barrel to 70 kilograms, but 70 kilograms per barrel still makes it a fairly carbon, well, very carbon intense crude oil compared to like the US national average, for instance. And on top of that, absolute emissions went up from 68 to 80 megatons a year in between over the last decade. So I, I guess what I'm, and then of course, IHS market is, is forecasting that production is gonna go up another 650,000 barrels a day, be over 4 million barrels a day by 2030. That is an enormous challenge, I think. Uh, what's your response, sir? Well, I think it's, you know, that's an enormous challenge that, that faces the world, and that's the oil sands and Canada's part of it, like you've just described. We have a rising demand, still a rising demand in world demand uh, in, for, for oil products, for liquid fuels. And, and so how do, we, how do we reduce the emissions from the production of oil and gas, in this case in the oil sands, while meeting uh, a rising global demand. And we see there are alternative energy sources coming on and, and great advancements being made there. But in the meantime, while energy, is, energy demand or the demand for oil and gas is still rising, we need to take steps urgently to reduce the emissions from that oil sands production, to reduce emissions as deeply and as quickly as, as possible. And so, Sure, you know, the last 10 years we've, we've seen through technological advancements that reduction, that's going to continue. But I think what you're seeing the industry stay with the pathways announcement with these individual companies and the kinds of collaborations happening at COSIA and elsewhere, um, they're going to take this journey together. 
collaboratively. You're not seeing other, you know, to the scale that you see it in Canada, you're not seeing that level of collaboration elsewhere uh, in other oil producing regions of the world. Um, and, you know, to that respect, you know, the years ahead, and again, I'll refer to the solvent and the CCS and, and, and other technologies, you're going to see that come down. Again, we've shown that track record, um, that intensity is going to come down. I guess the second point I would make is, you know, some of the newer uh, facilities, some of the more, the ones that have, you know, the green field or the, the, the newer facilities that have come online more recently, that have been using the newer technologies, those are at or below uh, the global average, the North American average for intensity. So sure, the average is coming down. You know, you group all the oil sands together. The, oil, the average is coming down, definitely. That's a great sign. That's going to continue. But I think what's missed in that is the newer facilities, the ones that have and are actually deploying the newest technology, those are at or below the average. We know there's more work to do. Um, and, and that's ongoing and, and excited about, you know, this journey after pathways and what the companies are committing to do together. Right. Well, let's talk about that because the, at the lower end, you've got 37 to 45 kilograms of CO2 equivalent per barrel. That's yeah. under, below the, the U S crude oil average, but on the high end, you've got, some of them are up at 200. Yeah. I mean, that's very, very high. Those are the older facilities and it's almost, it's very, very difficult to decarbonize those facilities. What has COSIA got in its bag of technology that's going to lower emissions significantly from those operations? Well, I think that's a, you know, that's a feature of any oil producing region or oil field in the world. There's gonna be low and high and look, I'm not gonna get into all of the, the you know, details in a, in a high level conversation here, but yeah, there are, you know, the older assets, um, sure, there are, are uh, some sites that reduce or produce higher emissions than others. You know, the things that that COSIA is working on, though, uh, are, like I said, and these are pathways, these are things that have been announced by the CEOs involved in the Net Zero Pathways Alliance, things that COSIA is working on. CCS, uh, you know, again, we'll look at what, what's happened in the last, you know, look at our track record. Well, you've got Quest, you've got Horizon, you've got the trunk line, you know, together, you, you put that together, there's very few, um, what I'll say is, you know, the Canadian Natural, for example, the, the owner of the, the fifth largest owner of, of CCS assets in the world, the trunk line is the largest of its kind in the world. These are significant achievements. This takes engineering and, and a lot of technology development. That's in the track record. Going forward, you know, the, the experience and the technical information from the Quest and Horizon experience has been shared with COSIA members. That's being factored into the development and deployment of, of future assets. You know, you look at things like CO2 conversion, one of the other multiple C's in the CCS um, uh, acronym, you know, on carbon conversion, we've just completed the X prize, right? This is a six year project that's just ended, you know, a couple of months ago. And what we see or what we feel the oil sands has done, we funded this. It was a COSIA X prize for, for carbon conversion. We feel like with that competition, we gave and we wanted to give a big nudge, a big shove onto the world stage for carbon conversion technologies, where we take the CO2 coming out of, you know, natural gas fired combustion, like we have on OTSG or, or once through steam generation um, units and converting it into valuable products. Look, they, that's another thing we're proud of, but coming down the pike, you know, looking at other things that we're working on. Another one is molten carbon and fuel cells, where you take I guess I oversimplified raw flue gas, turn that into electricity um, and compress CO2 for injection. So look, there's other things. Obviously we've talked about solvents, uh, there's energy efficiencies, there's process improvements. There's a number of technologies that we can talk about here. Like I say, it's the next 10 years that are most exciting. 
Well, let's talk about some of that because you you brought up uh, you brought up solvents, and so for those who don't know, uh, in situ production, steam assisted gravity drainage, uh, it uses creates steam using burning natural gas and force it down into the reservoir. And the idea is to uh, replace some or all of that steam with light hydrocarbons. And this has been under development for years. Sonovus has been one of the leaders. I've interviewed uh, Sonovus going back to like 2015, 2016 about this. And it's still not deployed at scale. And I guess this is, you know, when you say there's a lot in the pipeline, Wes, the problem is that it's, they're still in the pipeline, you know, and how, what's the plan to get some of these technologies uh, to, uh, to scale and do it in a, in a much quicker fashion? Well, on something like solvent and like you, you're right, there's a number of Canadian oil sense companies that are, are developing and piloting solvents. You know, I, I think with any heavy industrial technology breakthrough, brand new, game changing heavy industrial technology, um, these things take a tremendous amount of time and money, as you know. And so, as a company, they will try to iterate and refine that technology through both work in a lab or at bench scale and in the field on field demonstrations, iterating to improve two things technical performance and work out the kinks. There's all kinds of operational issues, operationalization issues that come along with this kind of first of a kind of brand new technology. The other thing they work on is, is the economic viability. That takes time and a tremendous amount of money to demonstrate. And so you've seen Synovus piloting out, you know, solvent driven and solvent assist process. You've seen Suncor in the field with, with NSolve. You know, you've seen companies looking at you know, electromagnetic and, and Conoco and Imperial, like there's a lot, there's hundreds of millions of dollars being spent on doing precisely that. This take, and this is what I emphasize, energy transitions take time, you know, significant reduction of emissions from heavy industrial processes takes a lot of time. I think what you're seeing with pathways and certainly what COSIA is, is geared towards is how can we accelerate that? How can we go faster? Our hypothesis is, and more than a hypothesis, our proof point is you go faster and further when you go together. And, and that's what we're seeing a commitment to, not only with COSI in 2012, but with what Pathways committed to, as you mentioned a couple of weeks ago. Well, one of the things about the Pathways initiative announcement that, that caught my eye was that many of those technologies are, are in development, they're emerging technologies, and the, the press release makes that, that very clear. But the problem is that they're not expected to, you know, be even close to deployment at scale until the 2030s. And that's a long ways away. And so reductions have to be made by 2030 uh, to meet, because uh, the pathways said that, you know, they want to help Canada meet the climate mm -hmm. targets. So absolute emissions have to start going down. So what, what happens between now and 2030 uh, you know, with uh, given that these other technologies, SMRs and, and so on, are, you know, 15, 20 years away. What do you do between in the next nine years? We have to advance the ball on a number of, of, of timelines. Um, there's technologies that are, are technically viable here and now for ready and, and are actually commercially deployed uh, in places all over the world, including here, that being CCS. Um, you know, you have to look at the technologies that will be available. You know, your portfolio of technology development needs to include things that are in the near term, not the here and now, but also the near term, where, you know, there's a bit more iteration to be done, later technology readiness. Then you need to be looking at what's good, where do we want to be in five years? Where do we want to be in 10 years? There's a reason why we're talking about 2030. That's 10 years, nine years. It's going to take this is going to be measured in the scale of years with the technology that we see as maturing now. In the 2030s, you know, there's a reason why we talk about net zero by 2050, not by any other date. It's going to take 30 years to take, you know, there's things that are purely ideas now that need to progress through fundamental research, bench scale, lab scale, all the way up to full scale commercial development. We need to be advancing ideas that are, you know, seeds of ideas now, all the way over to continue advancing the things that are actually ready now. And so I, I hope I'm answering your question. I, I just go back to the point that says, 
any one of those technologies, whether it's CCS and deployment of current generation CCS, takes a lot of time and money to get that online. You know, change, you know, look at the other end of the spectrum, things more on the lines of SMR, um, other, you know, energy technologies that need that demonstration that, you know, there's years, decades to get that stuff. We need to start now, I guess is what we're saying. We have to do the near-term stuff, the medium-term stuff, the long-term stuff all needs to be advancing. And there's a reason why this is 2030 and 2050. Well, okay. Uh, I understand uh, uh, all of that. But here's uh, something. Uh, and we'll finish up the interview with this, Wes. You sit around the table with this, the oil sand CEOs. These are the people who are writing the checks and making the decisions and who made the, the commitment in to net zero by 2050 in the Pathways Initiatives announcement. T can you tell me with absolute certainty that these folks are committed to reducing emissions in a timely fashion and this is not window dressing it's not greenwashing it's not uh, you know foot dragging or delay you know to buy themselves some time I... yes absolutely and i think what i'll say is i, I think canada should be i mean canada is a place where we are heavily scrutinizing environmental performance. We take the environment very seriously. You know, we have one of the strongest regulatory regimes in the environment. I'll leave all of that. It's something Canadians take extremely seriously, public or media or governments. Our industry does as well. I think Canadians should be very, very proud that the group of leaders that they have in Canada's oil sands uh, have committed publicly to this have been doing this for some time, this innovation together, I would say world leading and, and great technological innovation to reduce emissions. The companies that they lead are, like I said already, are full of people who are committed their careers and lives to, they, they care deeply about the sustainability of the industry and the environment. And you look at the kinds of projects, the lengths that industry, these leaders and these companies are going to, in terms of the individual projects, that's where COSIA plays. We see the types of projects that are the kinds of ideas, the potential solutions to reduce emissions, the things that we're spending money on, the early stage ideas, the kind of mid-maturity, mid-TRL level technologies, and the all of those things are being advanced. We're Canada's biggest spender on clean tech. I, I, I'll just finish by saying, I, I think Canadians should be really proud of the leaders for making this commitment and taking the steps that they are. And I think that will continue. Uh, I mean, we'll, Canadians will continue to be proud of, of the steps that industry is gonna to take together. Well, Wes, my guess on this is that the oil sands industry is going to face a level of scrutiny that's never faced before. And I don't mean by, you know, environmental groups that run cam campaigns. I mean by, you know, the federal government, by Canadians. And, you know, it, it's, uh, you're gonna, the, the industry is going to have to accelerate uh, its efforts because um, expectations, as you well know, have increased dramatically. So I, I appreciate your insights here and this information. Thank you very much for this. Yeah, thanks very much, Markham.